Okay, and uh, all we're gonna see on this is the outline. It's the same outline as always. And uh, Alan reminded us at uh, 1045, uh, our guest speaker will be joining us from the UK. Okay, let's start with introductions. Who are you and how do you get around? Now, I have to admit something. Uh, and before we started the meeting and recording, I mentioned that I meet with Zeno uh, uh, often. And uh, he said, well, it's nice. What do you drive? Why don't you ask, how do you get around? Because then we can talk about some other options. Like, are you driving an electric bicycle? Which is one of the things that he's very interested in. So on my screen, let me do it in the list here. David uh, Heacock, you're first on my list. Hi. Uh, I, I get around, or I live in Fairfield, so uh, I get around by driving my Avante, electric Avante. Now I got it all back together, the windshield's in got the dash put back in and the instruments are all seem to be working. Every time I take this thing apart, I keep wondering if I'm going to screw something up when I try to put it back together. But that, that's for me, if, as long as it's not raining or, or the weather is not bad, I'm, I'm going to drive that. I'm still trying to work the drivetrain out totally, but it seems to be running a lot better than it has been. I, I spent the other day about half the morning underneath it trying to figure out where I got a knocking noise. I don't know whether it's springs or what, but um, well, it's, I it's not a piston. Huh? I know it's not a piston. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's running running good. And um I'm kind of enjoying having an electric vehicle again. And I'm next on the screen, I should have said I'm Jerry Glazer. Um and I'm still driving my uh, uh Nissan Leaf 2018, but I got a note, I don't know if anybody else has a uh, a Nissan uh, from Jim Bone saying, we don't have enough used cars. If you want to trade yours in, uh, we'll <laughs> upgrade and give you another one wow. uh, with the same payment or really close to it for your vehicle. So I wrote back to the uh, sales guy and said, uh, uh, hey, is this, hey, Brent, is this really right? Because um, mine's electric and it's on a lease and was this just a mailing to everybody? So we'll find out what happens with that. Another well, I got I, I got a note. My electric scooter. So I, I got a note from I think the Bay Area Quality Management District said they'd give me twelve hundred dollars for my Avani or something. I, oh yeah, well great. <laughs> I wasn't going to jump at that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to go down the the list on the side here instead of on the screen because the screen keeps moving around here, and I hope the list stays uh, stable. Alan. Well, I'm driving a Model 3 now, uh, uh, solely that, but getting around mostly, I put more miles on my bicycle than my car right now. Uh, and Bruce, Bruce will have some more information about how he gets around. Okay, good. Uh, uh, let's see, I'm looking at, and you're there, or you moved again on here, Mark. Uh, yeah, I'm not driving too much when we do, it's the uh, 2013 RAV4 EV. I did go down to Jim Bone this last week and drive a brand new Leaf. Uh, What's the name they, have a, they have a heck of a deal now, and you can get the, the top of the line, which lists at 45000 But with all the different things that are going on now, you could, I could have gotten it for a little under 30000 Wow. Wow. But I didn't pull the trigger. Didn't, not driving enough to warrant it, you know? Yeah. Okay. Um, and even that screen's moving around. It says, Al, you guess. <laughs> uh, Al is driving an I-Pace. That's how I'm getting around uh, when I'm driving. All right. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I'm looking at my screen trying to find you. <laughs> I'm right here. Are you okay, good. <laughs> um, Caleb, you came in late, but yep. you're next on my list. I have a 2015 uh, BMW i3 with 36,000 miles on it. All right. It's a yeah. lot for a 20, 20 kilowatt hour battery pack. <laughs> uh, Lowell? Uh, yeah, I'm driving my, uh, uh, my Tesla mostly for, you know, any shopping or anything that involves longer distances like a trip to the city or something like that. But for uh, bike rides, mainly because I have the, the, uh, the hitch attached to the, to the leaf, I, I take the leaf out for that. And, um, and, but all my bike riding is, is recreational. It isn't uh, practical. And then I, I, I've been considering getting, getting a practical bike, a bike that can, you know, carry groceries and that sort of thing. And because my, my, the store I shop at isn't very far away and I could certainly do that. And, um, 
but uh, yeah, the um, the bulk of my driving is is with the Tesla. I mean, I I, I wouldn't uh, if if I have the option, I'll always drive the Tesla. I I, I really love that car. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and then and then to just you know the other stuff is uh, minor. But anyway, that's my story. Okay, uh, John, mm. Harley. Yeah. It's fun. I just realized, you know, the old method used to be, I'm John Palmer Lee, I drive, whatever, and now we've got all our names up here so we just can talk. It's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I still drive the, the green, the little uh, Geo Metro with a leaf motor in it. I'm continually amazed at how far that son of a gun goes. And uh, I never really knew its battery capacity until you know i've just been slowly advancing and i think it's actually got something like a 36 or 38 kilowatt hour battery in it it's just you know that's what it would have been if the cells were new but um I, it's just amazing what you know and and with the long the cool thing about the the large pack is that i i only charge it once a week or less and so you know, the duration of that pack is going to be, you know, at a, what, a couple thousand charges? Think of how far that is in the future. Yeah. <laughs> it's just amazing. Yeah. That's, that's the number one thing I like about the larger packs is that you don't have to charge them as often. And so the, the life of the pack goes way up. <clears throat> I'm done. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you're up. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm getting around these days by not enough walking. So uh, I really got to step that up. But uh, when I do, I've been going in the office a couple days a week, and I drive my nine and a half year old Leaf. All right. Wow. Uh, Bruce. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, I've got some some new toys in my my yard, and it was precipitated <laughs> by the sale of my Audi e-tron by the the new local EV only all electric used car salesman on Orcas Island. So. He sold my Audi to some some exec somewhere out of Seattle, a Google person, and uh, it'll probably be a like a second car for the islands here. But uh, with the proceeds, I ended up getting two more electric cars. I, I bought a, a 2016 e Golf with 13,000 miles on it, and I quite like it. Uh, knock on on wood. Uh, it, it, it's just like a regular car. So it's going to be my loaner car when I have guests, you know, because it's fairly simple to, to drive and it gets plugged in uh, regularly here. So that's good. And the other thing is I found this guy, he had a used Roadster for sale. And so now I'm driving a 2008 um, Tesla Roadster VIN number 101. And part of what precipitated that is we, we one of one of our soon to be locals here owns some property out on the, the far side of the island on, on the shore, has some experience with uh, Tesla, particularly the Roadster. So I figure I could always rely on this guy to help give me some pointers if I, you know, needed help getting it fixed or something like that. But now how many vehicles is that now? Well, I'm still back to six all electric vehicles and a folding electric bike. And so I'm trying to get the, I'm trying to use the two, uh, the RAV, Toyota RAV4, um, it's a 2023, 20, 2003, I think, or maybe newer than that, but uh, needs new nickel metal hydride batteries and then a Ford EV Ranger in the garage, which I know Ken has got some experience with and the folks at Thunderstruck. So um, I was hoping to have these like uh, remote instructional vehicles for the high school STEM facility. And we'll probably just start going ahead and, and trying to record as I go using um, 360 cameras and you know, basically make archival videos of, of the process. So I might be reaching out for some help like uh, help. I'm I'm under a big load of lead acid batteries that just fell out of the truck on top of me or something. So that I think that's an, enough for, said for me. So. Okay. And by the way, as I go through the list here, it keeps, you guys keep popping around on the screen and on the list and everything else. If I call on somebody twice, I can only hold about four or five things in my head at one time, and then and then I lose the list. Ray, I think you're I'm up. Not around much anymore. 
<laughs> and when I do get around, it's in a 2018 Model S driven mostly by my daughter. And uh, I thought I'd mention that since I got this in March of 2018, I have yet to spend my first dollar on either maintenance or charging. <laughs> All I've paid for is insurance and state registration. Now, you can't get much more economical than that. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Uh, in that vein, uh, one of the things that came out in reports recently is that we've now crossed, as far as for the lifetime on electric vehicles, electric vehicles cost less now uh, for uh, comparable vehicles uh, than the internal combustion engines as far as the life of the vehicle when you look at maintenance and the cost of fuel, et cetera. And that's regardless of where you are in the country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Uh, I'm looking at my screen. It looks like Ken's up. Yeah, good morning. Uh, Ken Coker. I drive a Tesla Model X. Probably got about 15,000 miles on it, so it it doesn't get a lot of use. Well, that's better than I'm doing on my leaf, so, you know, you, you get it <laughs> enough. Uh, Bill? Uh, let's see. <clears throat> yeah, um, I've got the... Uh, Kia Soul 2016 model, 44,000 miles now. Whoa! That's Aretha. And uh, not driving that much these days. I'm getting around, as I always do on our five and a half acre property, walking and walking and walking, doing gardening and other maintenance. And when I have to take a load somewhere, I use that 1950 Chevy pickup that I brought once to the meeting at Thunderstruck, uh, 70 years old, that thing's working. That's Aurelia, not Aretha. <laughs> All right, Sonia. Um, I just wanted to mention that when Ray said, I don't get around much anymore, I, it kind of triggered that Willie Nelson version of, of that song in my mind. That's been my story this week. Um, but I did go out to Wildflower Bakery this morning. I have a Model 3 and um, it's really beautiful out. And uh, the Model 3 um, just got a tire rotation for 39 bucks in my driveway, which was kind of cool. Um, and uh, the the back tires were down to like 530 seconds. So uh, I probably waited too long. Um, but pretty close. And then uh, sometimes, you know, we go out for errands and stuff. We also have a volt. So we take turns, just, you know, keep everything kind of running, I guess. And um, good point, uh, you know, good point on you don't have to really charge that frequently in a week anymore. <laughs> so, All right, Tor, it. you're up. All right. So, yeah, I'm. I mostly get around on a, a commuter bike in around town. Uh, my family guilted me into riding my bike for town uh -huh. errands years ago, so it's habit now. Uh -huh. And I uh, bought it, it's a breezer from uh, one of the bike shops in Sebastopol I bought about five years ago. Um, and then I'm driving a, a 2017 Bolt EV that uh, we keep extending its lease. So we, we I think we get two more months just kind of stretching it out and um yesterday i think we got an email that said they were recalling a couple because oh. of some battery issues uh uh when the batteries were fully charged that you know there was some risk of fire so that was new new information but um there there's i suppose you're, you're supposed to program it so it can only go up to 90 percent or re redo the settings um so that's my news I was wondering if um, that's now a standard on vehicles because the uh, 2011 LEAF allowed you to set different capacities. But when I got the 2018, it doesn't. So I was assuming that they were leaving the reserve space uh, and all of the storage X sessions that keep talking about how critical it is not to charge all the way up. And what yeah, BMW they, does that, the, yeah. The, the Bolt or Chevy said, you know, you, you might as well hear it from us first, you know, because I guess rumors yeah. are getting out. And 
I think there's, they still haven't, uh, uh, I think they're due to, uh, you'll be able to download a software upgrade that'll manage those settings shortly, so. David, I think you're up next. Harris. Uh, you're on mute. Let me unmute. Okay. Oh, there you okay. go. Now I'm not muted. Okay. Well, we. I'm just thinking. I haven't left the block uh, in a week. Seven days have been nowhere except walking around the block. But uh, so our bolt is sitting in the driveway with about twenty-two thousand miles on it, and uh, with our daughter doing remote school, she stopped talking about learning to drive. So. <laughs> She just turned 16, so uh, not thinking much about cars. Yeah, uh, yeah. I got a bike. Uh, Bernie, you're up. You're on mute. Yep. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, not nothing's happened here at all. Not not a thing. Oh, yeah. Actually, I'm uh, another. I'm a grandpa one more time. Oh wow. Uh, that happened a few days ago, and. Uh, uh, but uh, in terms of electrics, uh, still got my collectors, still got my cars, and still dreaming about uh, a battery that my wife won't let me buy. <laughs> uh, I'm waiting to turn my battery on, by the way. Uh, it, she's not letting you buy it because it's so expensive? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was very expensive. Uh, it's interesting. I'm still waiting for PG&E to say, yes, you can turn it on. Why? What, they haven't let. Why do that? Understand? That's a different presentation. I mean, we can do it in a discussion if we have time and when we get yeah. later on. But uh, I'll give you what I've learned so far about this from having solar panels since two thousand and six or so, and now the batteries. Um, it, it has to do with what the grid looks like and the analysis they have to do, and things that they have to check off on boxes as far as capacity and how the, the thing functions. Stan. Hi, uh, so we're still uh, have the uh, 2002 RAV4 EV. So, Bruce, whenever you get your uh, nickel metal hydride uh, batteries replaced, let me know. <laughs> and uh, then we have our 2020 uh, Tesla Model Y, which uh, Mark got to tool around in a while ago. And uh, so, no, not a lot of driving. I think our biggest run is about 12 miles. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Uh, Cecilia. Hi, I'm Cecilia, and um, I still mostly get around using my Model 3, but sometimes um, I do ride my electric, or not electric, but it's a, a folding bike, um, but it it's manually powered, but it does have a dynamo to power the light, so, you know. <laughs> Pseudo-electric. <laughs> All right, good. And you heard me earlier, I, I need some help on, uh, on groups and maybe we can get together later on that. Zeno, you're black, but you're muted. You wanna jump in? Yeah, hi, sorry I'm a bit late today. Um, yeah, I live in Sebastopol. Uh, I have a bike, I use my bike quite a lot these days, but I also have a, I don't know, 14 year old uh, Honda Inside, so a hybrid. Um, and probably my next car, if there ever will be one, will be electric. Uh, I know from this group tour and Gary, the best, Gary and I meet probably every, not every week, but quite regularly on Monday for coffee and we talk things through. And I started doing an electric bike, an electric uh, car course at, uh, that he is also taking at uh, University of Delft in in the Netherlands. So I'm kind of trying to get up to speed on what's so great about electric. Uh, so I, I'm part of uh, Sebastopol Climate Action Group and I, my focus is on uh, active transportation, like biking and uh, so we talk a lot about that and the role of electric vehicles in, in the whole system. And I threw your name around a lot before you joined the meeting because, uh, John, hold it up. Are you still there? I lost John. Oh, you're still there. Okay. That showed up. Oh, wait, you have to say something, John, for it to 
Uh, can you actually see that? Uh, on my screen, I, I don't see it unless you say something. I'm saying something now. <laughs> so yeah, Kim Stanley Robinson's uh, new book, the you know the Ministry for the Future. I'm sorry to read it. You should come to our reading group. Where do you live? In uh, Santa Rosa. Yeah, we have a, a, a we have in December a, a little group of people, six in the backyard, talking about this book. So uh, if you are interested, you could have a coffee with us in the backyard around. Uh, and homemade cookies. Big table, and yep. Gary will explain why this is not a great book, but. Um, <laughs> he, although it's not a great book, he, he, he finished it, which is amazing. <laughs> Did you start, by the way? I haven't yet. No. Okay. And, and uh, John, tell them where you got the book from. Well, uh, it was Jim McGreen. He stopped off at work. We're friends. Oh, so okay. I worked for him at Switch Vehicles for a while and then quit. Um, very important reasons and yeah, yeah, Jim will be there yeah, yeah. Oh, okay <laughs> well good and if you come to that then you can also stick your head in the garage because Zeno and I are trying to fix the zap uh, scooter <laughs> yeah we, I have, that's right I have this electric scooter that hasn't been operating for two or three years uh, yeah. but I used to use that quite a lot actually and I got a lot of experience from help from you, you guys and others uh, especially uh, Caleb and, and uh, some more people and John uh, and I got my scooter working, but I'm scared shitless to use it. So I go to Zeno's house on it, but that's about it. You know, that's about as far as I go. All right. Uh, Thanks. Let me get back to the right window here. Uh, chapter business. Uh, this basically just is the same stuff we had before. I don't have an update on what we have in our balance or how many official people have joined the NDAA. Um, the site's still difficult for me to get through. We have 137 Jay, names in our uh, Google group. Uh, Jerry, can I interrupt a second? Yeah. Um, I think we missed a couple people. Did we miss Bernie and Cecilia? No, we got Bernie, we got Cecilia. Oh, I, I was just uh, phasing out on that, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did I miss anybody? <laughs> no, Bill, that's not you. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we, did, did we miss anybody? I, I looked at the screen again. That, okay, was no, Sonia. No. that was Sonia. You know, I know that was Sonia. I just don't want to know if we missed anybody. No. On, on the intro. No. Oops, wrong way. Sorry. She can be our speaker next week. <laughs> um, also, I send this message out and it organizes or it used to organize everything in the Google group uh, so that when I put the deck together, I know what to add. And uh, that's why I need some help because uh, Google just changed it two or three days ago, and I don't know how to get back to where I was. Uh, we need help doing presentations. Um, we've had people suggest many presentations. Uh, one that Tor brought up was uh, somebody put together a presentation on what are the different networks that exist uh, throughout the country and how are they being used. There's more that have actually been showing up. Um, one about research on, on fleets and what's happening with fleets. It looks like there's a lot of activity in fleets because the cost profile that's now showing up and the number of companies offering um, support for fleets is growing rapidly, uh, mainly because they actually see this as costing them less. So uh, they, they might be environmentalists, but uh, more so they're finding that economically it's gonna work well for them. Um, used EV trends, that came up in one of our meetings too. People wanna to know about that. And then, uh, uh, I sent out to a number of people, uh, what do you think about uh, a talk on uh, e-bikes? Uh, this was an idea that came from Zeno as well. Uh, and I got a whole bunch of positive, but thus far we haven't found somebody who feels like they're qualified to put the talk together. One point I'll make, out, make about that is that I gave that talk in December, I think it was of last year on batteries. Before I put the talk together, I didn't know shit about batteries. So uh, if somebody wants to do some research and uh, it does take some time to do it on e-bikes and say, hey, this is what I found out um, in the short talk I gave on right sized vehicles, same thing. And somebody asked the question. So I started looking things up and put it together. But I'm unemployed. So, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for me to do. Um, 
here's our previous meeting and we had a really good uh, talk with Arkimoto. Thank you, David, for getting that arranged. Um, uh, those guys are, we're really excited about having attended our meeting. They thought uh, we were a great club uh, and we're impressed. And they asked, can they take clips from our video uh, to use for uh, their marketing? <laughs> so I don't know what they're gonna do. They're gonna send it back to us uh, to see if uh, it's all cool with us uh, before they use it. Um, this one was up, I think the last time I, I left it in there again, uh, there is all electric uh, building legislation that's in place. You just noticed uh, maybe that uh, uh, the city of San Francisco um, this uh, last week, I think or so, has now uh, passed their REACH code as well. They are um, starting next year, in fact, uh, no longer allowing uh, gas to be plumbed into new buildings. Uh, there's some details I want to research into that. Um, here's the news. Sorry, this is the news. When uh, Woody, too bad Woody's not here, uh, gave us uh, a little bit of update on the California um, uh, push for 2035 for no new uh, internal combustion engine vehicles being sold and 2045, no new um, um, trucks, uh, internal combustion trucks being sold. Um, I had written to a number of people saying, hey, uh, this is the size of California. We're going to influence other people in other places to do this. New Jersey has now uh, uh, done exactly what California has done, and almost to a line. Uh, so uh, that's the next state that's actually jumped on and said, okay, we're not allowing an internal combustion engine. Now that's really bizarre because I was in New Jersey recently and there ain't a shitload worth of electric vehicles driving around New Jersey and people there think, Oh, that's California, isn't it? <laughs> There's weird people in California. So I've been writing to them also about using inductive ranges. But Chico installed a new L2 charger. I ask a question about a previous slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the new L2 charger they installed in Chico. <laughs> I, did, that, I forgot who sent that to me. Who was who, who it that mailed that in? I, I did. No, okay, that's, my, that's my bolt in the background. Oh, it is. Okay, great. So it worked. Um, yeah, Zeno, what's the question? Well, the previous slide. So uh, does it say that um, we, California, we're 12% of the population, but 10% of the miles traveled? Yeah. So w that surprises me a bit because I think about us as, as a car culture and we drive a lot. Yeah. So why do we drive and what is the kind of where do people like in North Dakota, they drive a lot because they have to go far to get anywhere or who is this? I, you know, I don't know the answer to the question, but I, I picked up the statistics uh, when I put that together. It wasn't out of one article. Um, I, I looked and often what happens is that somebody will say, here's an article. And so when I put the, the uh, slide up, I don't rely on the one article, but then I go to the links and I go to other places because I don't understand what some of the articles are about. And so I picked up the additional statistics in different places um, that talked about that. I don't know the reason, but I do know people who live in North Dakota and when they want to go to the restaurant, there is a restaurant in town and it's 25 miles to town and there's only one restaurant. So perhaps that's the reason that uh, <laughs> uh, we fit in that, in that boat. We do, have, we do have the second most densely populated area in the United States as well, which might um, answer part of that as well. Does anybody know where that area is? You know, I, I would assume that this is influenced by LA and New York. Yeah, San Francisco is the second most populated area in the United States over New York. You know, New York is number one. LA uh, is not that densely populated because it's so large. Uh, we're pretty tight. So we're going shorter distances. I, but I don't know, Zeno. I mean, uh, somebody else sent this one in. Um, a reason for uh, in California to own an EV instead of an internal combustion engine. The internal combustion engine probably would have exploded uh, in the tank, but the leaf just melted. <laughs> 
<laughs> and uh, whoever sent this to me, again, who was it that sent this in? Uh, I did. This was parked right next to that uh, mobile gas charger. <laughs> It, it, it was uh, the um, Paradise Fire that, yeah. that survived. And you said the guy said uh, it charges just fine? That's right. No, <laughs> it, it, been using it continuously ever since it got that melt in the Paradise Fire in 2018. Yeah. So why did the battery not explode? Uh, it's underneath the vehicle and uh, the uh, chemistry used in that battery has a little bit higher um, uh, ignition point, but other than that, I don't know. I mean, it wouldn't explode, Zena. It would burn. It would burn, yeah. right? Yeah, I just wanted. Let me just say that at uh, Thunderstruck, we got a leaf that came in that was entirely burned. The top, internal, everything. The 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 uh, it got hot enough to catch the uh, seats on fire and everything. And we removed the battery from the bottom, and it was uh, although we didn't feel like we could sell the the cells, we used them for internal projects, and they're they're just fine. I mean, even some of the cells that showed signs of plastic melting internally, they still hold a charge and still work, which is amazing to me. Anyway, um, this one. Uh Again, I forgot who said I, I, I sent this in, Jerry. Yeah. And uh, uh, after I sent it in, I'm mean, what what's the the information that's shown here is accurate as far as sales go, except they've left out a few. The actually the second and third top selling vehicles are two Chinese vehicles, yeah. BYD and BAIC, um, that are close but. Uh, still not as much as uh, the Tesla Model 3. Yeah, and, um, and this, you notice that the, I have the BYD in the in Oh, the you table. did? I see that, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but I, I'm, I was surprised to see what, this had to do with the numbers for some period also, which might be a little bit different. But this was really quite interesting because you can see the influence and you see the growth that's occurring. We saw it in our previous uh, meeting also that, um, uh, Europe had something like a 50% growth in, in EVs. Um, uh, we've had a decline uh, in EVs, but the decline that we had in EVs wasn't as great as the decline in internal combustion engines in sales. The other one that's not shown here is um, the, the GM partnership they have with their like microelectric car, which is outselling the Model 3, oh, but it's really? only, only $4,200. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. but it's all electric yeah and, and i also see here and i don't have this in the deck i think uh this time because i i have a link to it uh, later on uh the vw id3 is ranked number five in sales i went looking at the id4 which looked really interesting it's sold out already the first production runs already sold out they haven't built one yet wow. yeah so how much of this is uh, encouraged by subsidies and, and rebates and that kind of thing? Um, that's a good question. And, and uh, I have very old data on that, which had to do with Georgia. Uh, turned out Georgia had dropped subsidies. And uh, once they dropped subsidies, the EV sales plummeted. And it showed that subsidies were extremely important. Um, but I don't know if that's relevant any longer, Zeno, and, and it would be great for somebody mm -hmm. to look into that. Uh, the reason is that uh, we're getting very close to parity in the un, um, unincentivized cost of an EV over an internal combustion engine. We're within three years of parity. And after that, EVs will get cheaper and internal combustion engines actually will get more expensive. It has to do with volumes. Yeah. We may also lose subsidies for oil and gas. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Which might create a different kind of um, yeah. influence on gas prices. Yeah. But, but for sure, sorry, one thing for sure, in China, uh, the sales of the various EVs, that has influenced a great deal. I was looking at the prices of the Chinese, and you know this better, Alan, than I do. I was looking at the prices from one of the shows. I was blown away by what the price 
they sell the EVs at. So they build the incentives in before uh, the sale. The other thing in China that's really a, a, a significant influence is their uh, taxation and their registration cost. So to register a car like in well, any of the major cities, if you have a combustion car, you may not even be able to register it. Uh, but if you can, the registrations are like $20,000, yeah. whereas EVs are free in most cities. And, and, and the, re the combustion cars uh, can only go into the major cities every other day where an EV can go in every day. Yep. Some of the, de the, some of the uh, financial issues have to do with like lifetime uh, cost of a car. Right, not the upfront cost of a car. Mm -hmm. So, Jerry, are you talking about it will like be parity in upfront cost, or are you talking? No, about we're already at parity on lifetime cost. This is parity at sale. So, how are, how are people able to make that visible? What, what's happening is the cost of production is dropping as the volumes go up. No, no. My question is, uh, how can we make that more visible? That ah. Because people tend to think about upfront costs and not have that time perspective about lifetime. I don't want to answer that because we actually created a group that is not active yet that I wish was working on these things uh, called the press group in, in the club. And, and nobody's joined the press group so far to answer press questions and do outreach. And I think the answer to the question is doing the outreach with numbers and getting at the various places is how we do it but we need volunteers to do that. Uh, and, and Alan's been, been the one that's been doing all of it still. <laughs> Whenever somebody asks a question, Alan's the one doing the response on it. Um, I, I'm gonna keep pushing forward because I wanna get to 1045 at, at, you know, and get through the slides if I can. Um, uh, Tesla is doing a massive push for more service. Um, over a million Teslas on the road today throughout the world. Uh, and they only own 466 service stations as Sonia just pointed out. And I found out from my cousin's son. Uh, yeah, they come out and do service in your, your driveway because they don't have service centers. Um, they're expecting 500,000 new cars in the next 12 months. So a 50% increase in the, the number of vehicles uh, that uh, will be put out and they know they need more service. So they're planning on uh, building uh, multiple services. They're gonna ramp that up. They're gonna start with 20 and, and get to a much larger number over time. A wireless EV charging. Um, everybody seems to think this is important. This actually showed up. Uh, who sent this one to me? I, I sent this. Uh, and and what's, what's interesting about it is that it's uh, a new standard for wireless charging up to 11 kilowatts. But uh, shoot, uh, as far as overnight charging, I, I don't know anybody that uh, charges at more than 11 kilowatts. So it's, it's, it's pretty good in 94% uh, grid to battery efficiency. Pretty, pretty nice setup there. Uh, so hopefully, you know, that'll uh, give some people a little bit more comfort in getting an EV yeah, if, yeah. if they really have trouble with the charging aspect of it. But I doubt they're going to do V to G with it, right? I doubt it. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Only if you want to heat your soup at the same time. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, um, I'm going to keep going ahead on the slides. I know we were set for, uh, uh, ten, Alan told you to join in at 1045. Uh, but if it's okay, we'll push up to 11. Uh, if, if, will that work for you? Okay, good. Um, uh, there's a, did you send this to me too, Alan? I don't think so. Okay. Um, a new EV charger, uh, which is a complete uh, um, distributed uh, energy uh, resource. Um, uh, $5,000 and what it does is it comes with two plugs. One is a DC plug and one is a, a L2. Uh, it supports V to G off the DC plug. Um, it will integrate with your, uh, your solar system and it becomes your solar inverter at 15.2 kilowatts, which was more than enough for everybody's solar system, except perhaps Bernie's. Um, and 
it will do direct DC to DC charging of your vehicle <laughs> off of your solar system, which is kind of interesting too. So I'm not sure how all of this will work. Uh, and it will also integrate with your stationary storage system. Um, it, and it optimizes uh, uh, all of the storage and it has weather data, forecast data, utility rates, et cetera, in an AI engine inside of it. And you can install it indoors or outdoors. Uh, the article that I was pointed to said, this is a game changer. So a lot of these things uh, are showing up. They may disappear, but this one was pretty impressive as, as to everything else. My dog's at the beach, by the way, right now. So that, uh, <laughs> yeah, did anybody all see this one? I mean, that, that, I, I sent I sent this one in. Oh, and, okay, good. Yeah, uh, good. this one's this one's pretty cool, in that uh, the it has I believe twenty eight breakers in in it, and so uh, thirty two, like thirty two circuits. Oh, okay. I thought it was okay. Thirty two. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, like all circuit breaking panels, you uh, label each one, and it it can tell you uh, because it's a smart got smart hardware in it. Uh, with the app, you can see how much your toaster is using, if it has a, a dedicated circuit, that sort of thing, um, and uh, it will uh, integrate you know the charging so that uh, it. You're, you're charging at the right, you know, at the most economical time and, and so on. Uh, so it's uh, seemed like a pretty good deal for those who haven't yet uh, had uh, the electrical panel modification yeah. for their solar battery backup system. And, and it's actually, Alan, it, I looked into it. It's a little bit one, one step further. Now. I actually sent this off to Synergy Solar. They were tracking these things too. A part of what's interesting about it, and, and those of you who put battery systems in already and know about this, you, you developed a critical load um, system so that you can, where we live, when the power goes out, you still have power. Uh, what this does is that the critical loads are actually programmed into the panels. You don't need a separate panel. It actually knows, oh, those circuits are my critical loads. I'm gonna keep that circuit up when the power goes out. It also detects and does the uh, switching automatically that is done as a separate activity in most of your solar systems that will take you off the grid when the grid goes down to protect uh, the guys working on the lines. It has that built in. It has it built in at, at uh, 200 amps, uh, which a lot of the new panels are at. And the back plane on this is 225 amps. So you can put your solar on top of it. Uh, just most solar systems will not be more than 25 more amps. So you could have feed in 200 amps off of the utility, 25 amps off your, your solar at the same time. It is already available with the LG uh, uh, Resu system. And I've got the Sonic system. Alan's got the, the uh, um, Tesla system. So, uh, you know, um, but uh, it's something interesting. Uh, and a lot of people are talking about this as a game changer. The price at, at uh, $2,500, a panel's a lot less expensive than $2,500, but this takes the place of, of so many other parts. So you don't need separate panels, you don't need a separate switch, you don't need a bunch of other things. One of the problems that will occur is this, building inspectors are gonna, are gonna be going crazy because they have no idea what this does. It is a software system uh, built into a panel with an AI on top of it. So it's really cool. I'd, I'd be concerned about lifetime serviceability of something like this. Yes, as well. right. There's a uh, large investments have gone into the company now too. That's a lot of eggs in one basket. You can't take that offline. Like you can take pieces oh. of Tesla's offline. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this one tore. Uh, this is why your, your question about uh, networks. I ran this one too. Who did you send this one, Alan? Who sent this yeah. one? Yeah. Yeah. So, so those two uh, uh, Kenworth and Peterbilt models are, I think, series uh, six and seven uh, box trucks, as the photo shows here. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's pretty cool that that uh, pack car um, is the parent company of both those uh, trucking companies uh, and or truck manufacturers. And uh, so they're going to uh, offer full service uh, um, uh, 
charging uh, equipment uh, for their customers. So I think it's a smart deal on their part, uh, sim similar to what the idea that Tesla has, you know, uh, don't, don't wait for the public charging to uh, provide what, what is necessary for their product. Part, part of what I liked about this, and I have a second slide on it too. So we'll get to, I forgot what I put on the second slide because I don't have the, the presentation in, in preview mode for myself. Um, was, uh, I, I didn't realize that uh, Pekar uh, owned both companies. I didn't see that. Um, well, that happened uh, 40 years ago. Okay, okay. Um, but I thought it was really interesting, you know, the building of the network and then doing the testing. But more than anything, uh, one of the things was supply chain building supply chain. And uh, so that's, that was my second slide. And the second slide was basically looking at this saying, where's the supply chain? Um, and where they're getting the pieces from. And, and uh, Caleb, look at the picture right over here. Yeah. Does that look familiar? It's a TM4. It's a TM4. Okay. <clears throat> so it's Dana... Beautiful. Because they're using Nordressa. <laughs> yeah. So Dana, uh, you know, went ahead and, and bought TM4 and Dana's bought some others too. So now they're uh, increasing the supply chain so that if you're building something ground up, you have places to go to, to get the critical parts that engineers went nuts trying to find uh, different parts and pieces for uh, before. And a lot of the stuff is pretty esoteric. The, TM4 is a pretty impressive piece of equipment. And it actually integrates a couple of pieces at one time as well. Mm -hmm. um, Australia is seeking green hydrogen. Uh, in the Stanford presentations, uh, Stephen Chu keeps thinking hydrogen is going to be an important player uh, at the heavy vehicle level. Uh, hydrogen is probably going to be an important player. Uh, and uh, 435 miles north of Perth, uh, they sent out essentially what's an RFP uh, for somebody to put together solar, wind, uh, in order to generate hydrogen and make hydrogen a fuel that's going to be used. Yeah, who sent this one in? Did I just trip on this one? So anyway, this one is green hydrogen. I put a, on the right-hand side, what kinds of hydrogen are there? Uh, most of the hydrogen that we use today uh, is basically brown. Uh, we get it out of methane. Uh, uh, blue is if you're doing the methane, but you're capturing the carbon and, and you're sequestering it, and then there's gray and black. Uh, so most of the hydrogen, and that's the reason hydrogen hasn't been all that popular, is that even from an environmental point of view, it's, it's cycles, not such a great cycle the way we do things today. And they're trying to address that with this. Their numbers were fairly large, 1.2 gigawatts of solar uh, and they're putting in to, to do this in and 270 megawatts worth of wind in order to generate the hydrogen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Siemens is doing another five gigawatt hydrogen project in the same region. So uh, that must be a push in Australia. There's, there's another one that's uh, on the proposal as well. That's a 10 gigawatt solar project in Australia. It's separate from both of those. Um, who sent this one to me? Because I dug into it a little further. Somebody, uh, somebody sent in the high efficiency solar cells. Was it you, John? It was you. Do you want to talk to it? Or you want me to? Me? Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So back, basically, this is black silicon. And it has to do with the way silicon is processed. Um, and, and they say they have 132% efficiency. Well, you can't have 132% efficiency. Uh, what they're really saying, and this came out of Finland, research in Finland, um, two things happen with the, and the black solar cells have been around for a long time, by the way. Uh, and part of the uh, solar cells actually use part of the, the black. And it's in order to reduce the amount of reflection that occurs, uh, both uh, visible reflection, but in this case, uh, they're actually capturing, I think it was UV as well as visible. So and they're measuring the visible as 100%, but they're getting UV. And a lot of the reflection, what they've been able to do because of the mechanical properties of the, of the solar panel, that's the, the shape of, the, of it, um, it reflects back into itself. So uh, energy, which would have been lost in reflection, now reflects back into it. So they have a second chance to capture it and so they get much larger. Um, there were uh, pieces where 
uh, in fact, right here, the first black silicon models, uh, production models came out in 2018 with a 20.78% uh, efficiency. Uh, sun power panels have a higher efficiency uh, without uh, advertising that the black silicon. So I didn't know if this was a real game changer or not. Well, let me just add that um, the, the deal with the over 100% is, is sort of a technical thing that is, you have to have more of a quantum mechanical physics background to understand, I think, because it, what it means is that you get one photon in and you get more than, you know, one. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. sorry, it's the last bullet, yeah. So that's, that's what's weird about it and they are trying to understand it, but yeah. it, it shows up to be true. Doesn't mean it's a hundred more than a hundred percent efficient as far yeah, as yeah, getting, yeah. you know the light in, but it's it's just a radical change in how much. Uh, and and John, part part of it that I couldn't find when I looked at the papers was uh, those two photons that come out. What's the frequency of the photons that are coming out, which would dictate it's the amount of energy. So you're not going to gain energy out of this. Uh, you know, I, I don't think that's going to change at a physics level. I hope not. Is this used on new materials or um, rare mineral, rare metals, or what is the... What no, no, no. This is just has to do with the way that the silicon is melted. And uh, uh, so it, it's a mechanical process. It's not a doping process. I think from what I read. There, there may be some additional doping going on, but it's yeah. obvious. We don't have all the information. Uh, let me just remind everybody, you know, in all the uh, decks that we put together um, so that I'm not stealing people's ideas, the links where the material came from is down here. So I'm giving credit to it. But also, if you get the deck uh, off of our website, off our, our drive, which you all have access to, uh, you can go to those links and read the raw articles and, and get more information. There's more links beyond that. So if you get interested in one of the topics, you can, you can really drill down into it. You know, it, it might be nice to have those links somehow clickable in this screen. Is that, that's not possible, is it? Because it's a... It's clickable in this screen. No, it is not. No, it's, I'm sorry, it's On not it. clickable in the video. I can't make it clickable in the video because I'm too ignorant to do that. That's okay. I just... Okay, I, I can do it in the presentation deck. It, it is clickable in the PDF that is posted. Okay, okay. yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I stepped right on top of this and I'm not sure what I wrote down on this. Um, uh, Zeno, did you send this one to me? No, I don't. well, maybe I don't know. Must be but, and, who sent this one about Rokit? So, uh, sorry, Rokit is, is opening up the largest e-bike manufacturing facility in the United States. I don't know if it's the largest in the world. Uh, they're planning next year to produce 300,000 electric bikes and ultimately 900,000 units per year. Um, they're doing it pretty much manually. They're not using robots. They wanted to increase the number of people working. Uh, and this is down in the Los Angeles area, outside of Los Angeles. Um, and they said that uh, the reason for doing this and making this investment, I didn't, never heard of this company before, but it turns out they sell all kinds of different products. Um, and uh, uh, they're looking at it and said the e-bike market is going to explode. Um, and they already have 10 designs that they've bought the rights for. They're not inventors of e-bikes. So they're producers of products. And so they're making a, a, a facility for this. And the, they're looking at the, the market was $7.6 billion uh, two years ago. And they're looking at it to move to $46 billion by 2026. You guys know how I care about airplanes? Um, I'm sorry, Woody and June aren't online today, um, but the aviation industry is trying to become environmentally sound. Um, it is 65 million jobs and $3 trillion worth of revenue uh, a year. There are fuels now which can be used and are produced uh, in Texas and shipped um, and actually to San Francisco now, and they have separate tanks in San Francisco for environmentally uh, sound uh, diesel essentially coming from plants and waste. Uh, the problem is they cost twice as much. Uh, and airlines, uh, Bernie probably could tell us more about airlines than the cost of airlines. Um, uh, the fuel cost is, is, is dramatic. Uh, and so doubling the price would be a large impact into the industry. So something called SAFs, and this came from uh, RMI. Rocky Mountain Institute. Uh, SAFs have been created 
uh, and these are coupons that you can buy, which actually pay for the offset between the cost of the two fuels. Bernie, you took yourself off the of mute. You got something to say? Well, only that, uh, yeah, it's about 50% of the cost of an airline operation is uh, fuel. Yeah. So I, I, I ran a calculation on, on, on this, which was interesting. Uh, and I put it down at the bottom because I, I was really curious about this. I wish I had this for GA so I'd feel better about flying my plane. Um, it was that uh, if I wanted to fly from, I uh, want to be a passenger of a fully uh, a loaded aircraft going from San Francisco to JFK, that the difference in cost and fuel for me as a passenger is about 50 bucks. And be honest, I'd be willing to pay the 50 bucks. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. And anyway, there is a mechanism now where you can actually pay for them. Uh, and so you can be offsetting, really offsetting. Uh, <coughs> go ahead. John. Yeah, I see you. Yeah, I'm just wondering, um, help me out, understand the, the real benefit of, of still burning a fossil fuel. I mean, a, um, a carbonaceous fuel um, doesn't produce less CO2, does it? I mean, what's the... It produces the same amount. You know, so if you look at the green environment, we're always going to produce CO2. Unless all you've got, if everybody will please stop breathing, we'll stop producing CO2. So we're going to produce CO2. The question is this, did the energy that was used to make that CO2 available come from the budget that was given to us, which is the solar power that we've received? Or... Uh, is it from solar power that was sent here eons ago? And in this case, they're using banana peels. Okay, the banana was built this year. And so the CO2 being released is from energy that was captured this year. It's the same thing as using your fireplace and, and burning wood, which is environmentally, uh, from a CO2 point of view, uh, superior to any other source that you're using to... to you know, heat your home, for instance. Okay. Is the is the point then that the banana, banana when it rots or gets digested, the peel by bacteria it will still produce the CO two? Yes. At the point. Absolutely. Yeah. In this case, you're, you're making use of the energy. Well, and there's some post processing for making it into this, but it, if you're using renewable sources to produce the energy that's being used to process it, then you're still on a net positive. Yeah. And outcome. in fact, the one company uh, which is doing this in Texas. Uh, has a customer in San Francisco airport. And so they ship the fuel to San Francisco airport by ship. And they power the ship using the fuel that they produce <laughs> so that they can be totally green from, uh, from production uh, to use. Who's the airline that's uh, buying it? You know? I don't know. I, that was in a previous presentation that I had, uh, Bernie. Um, that I had seen that. That's why I knew that information. It was either last month or the month before that I ran across that. Gary, let, let's. Uh, it's. it's yeah, a, yeah, I only got two more. We're going to get right well, there. Well, that's okay. Let's 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 get him started. Oh, okay. Are we at? Uh, yeah. Oh, we are. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay. Let me let me stop it right there, and we'll pick that back up again. Guys, if you if you got a few more minutes, you can finish the the presentation. Don't worry. Okay. Then we'll do that because it, it is really short. I think I have two or three more left. That's it. Um, we've got more aircraft. That's all that this slide is basically saying that are showing up. And it turns out Rolls-Royce is now working on a suite of motors for aircraft. Um, so we get getting into mainstream um, supply chain in the aviation field. And they gave a list, um, uh, Rolls-Royce gave a list of the different projects that are working on different size aircraft. Airbus is working on a large uh, aircraft, uh, City Airbus uh, with a BTOL, and actually has a, uh, a contract. Um, hybrid systems, which I thought for aviation was always a great idea because once you get to altitude, it wouldn't be nice, certainly in GA, to be using electric instead of uh, fuel, so you don't need turbo. It shows itself on the right-hand side, the different kinds of uh, motors and uh, engines that they're putting together. This was the last part, uh, which is from that course that uh, Zeno is taking and I'm also taking. It talked about the history of EVs. And I thought what was interesting in this, if it's gonna do it, was the first electric vehicle, British, came from the British, okay? Um, 
uh, uh, used non-rechargeable batteries, but that was 1832. <laughs> and again, the British again, uh, first practical production car was produced in 1884. But then we got to go off to Porsche and uh, Porsche did the first electric vehicle with motors in all four wheels as a production vehicle, 1901. First in wheel motors. There it is, okay? Lovely. <laughs> anyway, the history was uh, uh, an interesting history to look at. Um, and it says, why the hell did we waste 100 years? And the amount of research, any of you taking the Storage X series at Stanford, uh, you'll be really interested in seeing how fast batteries are being changed. Um, and uh, Zeno, you made it to the one on uh, last Friday. So that, that one now is coming back and, and talking more about uh, solid state batteries and the progress made on them in the last two years, which is amazing. Uh, and we ought to have a presentation on that too. I mean, we'll pick some of that stuff up. I was thinking about a follow on presentation of last year's presentation on batteries. Okay, Alan. Okay, uh, an intro. one of the uh, major factors in the efficiency of any car um, is it, are the tires. And uh, our speaker today is, uh, uh, has started a company to make uh, efficient tires strictly for EVs. So uh, he's working out of the UK and um, his name is Gunlager Erlinson. I hope I didn't butcher that, but anyway. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone calls me G. Okay. And, one... <laughs> <laughs> and I hate my parents for that one, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> So, take it away. Okay, uh, let, so let me make sure I've got this set up for just a second. I forgot to do something here. Yeah, yeah I need to host, right? Okay, you can, you can take it now, yep. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, before I share the, the screen, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, actually, I've been looking forward to this one, so it, it's, it should be fun. Um, to give you a bit of background, um, Enzo is, is a tire company exclusively focused on electric vehicles. And we come from a, um, a different parts of the tire industry. And what we have done effectively is collect some of the best minds of the, of the tire industry to, to, to focus them exclusively on, on electric vehicles for the last four years. And so we will be um, launching in the market next year. Um, a lot of the stuff I'm going to be telling you isn't public information. So uh, we're still in stealth mode. Um, but uh, there's going to be a episode about us on fully charged uh, next week. So, um, which is specifically focused on tire emissions. So we, 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 uh, we thought uh, timing is right. Let's, let's tell the world what we're doing. We've resumed our recording. So just thank you for the uh, opportunity to tell you about Enzo. For those who didn't sign up, well, you hear about us a bit later on, but we're happy to talk to you again. And then um, if you have any interests in communicating, g enzotires.com. We spell tires with a Y, as it's originally said. Um, but in America, of course, we understand that you do it differently. So um, just make sure you put a Y in your tires.
Okay, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Have a good evening. You Have too. a wonderful day. Thank you, guys. Love, love to come again. Okay, we'd love to have you again. Bye bye. Bye. Right. Um, um, we're going to skip the uh, uh, peanut gallery section, which I skipped right over. We always have a chance to talk anyway. Uh, here's a few cool links. Um, I saw a review on the Nissan Aria and the Mustang and the VW ID4, which is sold out right now already. Uh, and uh, you can get the video for last week's, uh, last month's uh, presentation. And then also this one that I think somebody sent to me, uh, Sandy Monroe, uh, doing a re review on why EVs, a history lesson on EVs. He was actually selling the concept of EVs. And I thought that was, it was interesting. Uh, and he actually believes who's going to be profitable, who's not going to be profitable in the industry. Uh, we don't have any presentation yet for next month. And uh, if I don't get something from somebody saying, we've got a speaker, I want to do it, you're going to be putting up with me presenting three ideas I have for policy changes in the state of California to uh, uh, incentivize uh, going from ICE to EVs. And another one on how the hell are we going to pay for the roadways if everybody's driving EVs, since we pay for it through a gasoline tax. And then finally, how could we raise some more money for uh, getting the carbon out of the atmosphere, which is part of what uh, Zeno and Jim McCrean and I were studying for the past year and part of what's covered in that book, but kind of lightly in the book. All right. That's it, gang. Um, Thank you very much, and we'll see you in December. Yeah, very, very good. Thanks. All right. All right. Uh, thanks.